The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show. More weird tales for weird times. With me, Charles Christian. This week we start a two-part interview looking at the mysterious career of Sidney Riley, one of the more iconic characters in the real world of spies, double agents and espionage. But before we do... We need to talk about Mother's Day and take another dive into the frequently confusing world of international traditions. Here in the UK, and also Ireland and curiously Nigeria, Mother's Day takes place this year on Sunday the 14th of March, which, depending on when you catch this show, is either this coming weekend or the weekend that's just gone. But in the United States, Canada, Australia and about 95 other countries around the world, Mother's Day takes place on the second Sunday of May, which this year is May the 9th. So, why the difference? The May version of Mother's Day is a tradition started in West Virginia in 1905 by Anna Jarvis to honour the role of mothers in family life. And after a slow start, the all-male US Congress of the time rejected the idea, saying they'd also have to proclaim a mother-in-law's day. By 1914, it had become sufficiently established to be recognised as a national holiday. Although Jarvis herself was subsequently appalled at the commercialization of Mother's Day, as candy makers, florists and greeting cards makers all soon spotted the money to be made and jumped on the bandwagon selling pre-packaged Mother's Day gifts. In this respect, the May Mother's Day is no different to the one we have in the UK. But what about the UK? Well, despite the fact Roman Catholicism ceased to be the country's official religion in the mid-16th century, it actually dates back to the medieval concept of Lent, when the fourth Sunday in Lent was called Mothering Sunday. Although this actually had nothing to do with mothers, but with visiting the Mother Church, where you'd been baptised. Interestingly, the fourth Sunday in Lent was also known as Refreshment Sunday, as it was a day of respite from the fasting halfway through the penitential season of Lent. Which probably explains why one of the traditions now associated with Mother's Day, at least in normal times when we're not in pandemic lockdown, is treating your mother to a big fat lunch. Although the practice of observing Lent faded for non-Catholics a long time ago, the idea of going to church on Mothering Sunday continued on until the early years of the 20th century, when people, inspired by Anna Jarvis's Mother's Day campaign in the US, started pushing towards creating a similar celebration of motherhood in the UK. Since the 1950s, Mother's Day in the UK now follows the same commercialised chocolates, flowers and cards model as in North America. Except we still stick with the mid-Lent date. This means that because Lent is linked to the date of Easter, Mothering Sunday moves around the calendar rather than has a fixed point. After Mothering Sunday, I'm sure you all know this, comes Passion Sunday, also known as Carling Sunday in the north of England, where it was a tradition for us to eat a meal of mushy peas. Then comes Palm Sunday and finally Easter Sunday. So let's get on with this week's interview, which sees the return of Richard B. Spence as our guest. Richard was last on the show in December when he was talking about the espionage career of the great occultist Alistair Crowley. This week, and next, we are looking at the frankly incredible career of Sidney Riley, an international master spy from the first quarter of the 20th century. Was he working for the Japanese, the Russians or the British? Or was he working for all three and double-crossing all of them? Did he nearly end the Russian Revolution before it began? And how on earth did he get involved with the Voynich manuscript? Richard Spence is an American historian, professor of history at the University of Idaho, 
He specialises in modern Russian, military espionage and occult history. He has produced biographies of Sidney Riley and of Alistair Crowley. And he's been interviewed for various documentaries on the History Channel and is a consultant for the International Spy Museum in Washington. His book on Riley is called Trust No One, The Secret World of Sidney Riley. Incidentally, for those of you with long memories, you may recall that Riley was once the subject of a very popular TV series called Riley Ace of Spies, featuring a young Sam Neill in one of his earliest starring roles as Riley. Although the real life Riley was nowhere near as good looking as Sam Neill, he was a notorious womanizer. Uh, my pleasure to be talking to Richard Spence, and this time we are talking about Sidney Riley, who possibly is better known in the UK as a result of a TV series frighteningly nearly 40 years ago with Sam Neill called Riley Ace of Spies. But um, he was also very popular in the uh, tabloid newspapers. And he's one of those people involved in a what-if moment. What if his coup attempt to assassinate Lenin and Trotsky had happened? Would that have changed world history? And uh, would the Russian Revolution have collapsed before it really got going? Richard, what got you interested in Riley? Well, just like you mentioned, and with so many other people, it was uh, catching that, you know, what was it, about a 1980 TV series, Riley yep. Ace of Spies, that, you know, seems yep. to have pretty much jump-started Sam Neill's career, mm -hmm. um, at least at least in the States. I, you know, I don't think anybody had ever heard of him before then. Yeah. And at that time, I was, um, I was still a a graduate student at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I was wrapping up my PhD. And one of the things that I had studied, you know, my area of interest was that whole Russian revolutionary period. And the whole, it was fascinating to me because I'd never heard of these people. <laughs> they, they'd never, they'd never really come up. Yeah. And what really intrigued me in watching this series was wasn't so much Riley himself initially. In, in fact, my my first feeling about it was that he was a fictional character plugged into an historical situation. Mm -hmm. I was wrong about that. But the one person that intrigued me the most was one of his uh, the, the, an historical character, one of his accomplices in much of the series, a guy by the name of Boris Savinkov. Mm -hmm. And Boris Savinkov was a very real Russian revolutionary and political figure. And again, what interested me about him is that in the in the history that I had read and was acquainted with, Savinkov was pretty much written out of it. And that got me interested in him. Uh, that eventually led to a – well, that, that was actually the topic I wanted to do my dissertation on. Uh, and here's an insight into higher education. Uh, when I approached one of my professors about that, they go, well, you know, Savinkoff is, you know, is an unimportant figure because nobody else has written about him. You know, mm. if he was important, mm. someone would have written a book about him. So you should do something else. <laughs> um, that was very bad advice. Yeah. And uh, it's. Savinkov turned out to be a fascinating figure in his own right, and I did, even though it wasn't my dissertation. As soon as I got my PhD in hand, I turned around and wrote a biography of Savinkov, and that's what got me really interested in Riley. Righty-ho, yes. Because yeah. Riley was oh, – he, he sort of you know, ran Savinkov around like a dog for, for, for much of their relationship. Uh, he was he was clearly the dominant figure in it. And, you know, Savinkov was, uh, after 1917, although he had been an anti-Tsarist revolutionary prior to that, he then became a fire-breathing anti-Bolshevik. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Savinkov was constantly roaming around between Paris and London and Berlin in the early 20s and the whole period between about 1919 and 1924. Constantly trying to raise money or get support, raise an anti-Bolshevik army, um, and 
Riley was, in many ways, his kind of business manager through this. He was the fellow who, you know, when Simonkoff would have a meeting with, let's say, Winston Churchill, which he did, the person who arranged that was Riley. Hmm. Of course, it was also Riley who arranged Savinkoff's meeting with Soviet officials in London and Paris, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, so that really got me interested in Riley. So I just decided I was going to find out more about this guy. And of course, you know, the, the, the kind of standard reference work on Riley about the only thing that existed at the time was the book on which the TV series was based, which was Robin Lockhart's. Ace of Spies or Riley Ace of Spies. Mm -hmm. That was published back, mm -hmm. I think, in 1966, 1967. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I guess there'd been efforts to get that made early on, made into a movie, which never went to anything. And then that eventually became the, the miniseries. So with Robin Lockhart's book to go on, uh, I began looking at different angles. And the, and the first one, I noticed what seemed to be kind of accessible, you know, something you could get into was – during the First World War, from really from around 1915 through 1917, Riley was in New York, and he was involved in war contracting business. He was ostensibly there working with the Russian Supply Commission. Um, this again is one of these little details, historical details, often no, you know forgotten, which is that you know for most of the First World War, the United States was a neutral country up until April 1917. Mm -hmm. But in the years prior to that, it was um, working overtime manufacturing weapons and munitions for just about everybody, at least in the Allied camp. Britain, France, and Russia mm. bought mm. huge amounts of munitions and weapons in, in the United States. And so what basically Riley was doing in New York in that period was that he was acting as a middleman in arranging these armaments and munitions contracts and made a great deal of money, money doing that. Well, Lockhart didn't really have much to say about that, and I thought, yeah, this is something you could investigate because anybody who's involved in business, uh, and particularly if they get involved in lawsuits, as Riley did, is, is going to leave a paper trail. So this is something you, we, could, we could elaborate on, and sure enough, uh, there were everything from newspaper articles to court records to passenger records, a whole variety of things that could reasonably well document Riley's presence in New York. And that's where things really began to get interesting because it was the first place where I realized that the kind of general story, the basic narrative, you know, from Lockhart's and others' books, didn't quite match the information I was getting. Right. But I wrote, right. a, I wrote an article about that, um, just, just about Riley's activities in New York, uh, and that was published. And, you know, one of the first people who, who approached me after that was none other than Robin Lockhart, who was still very much alive at the time and was yeah. very interested yeah. that I was interested in this topic. And that began a and I kind of on again, off again correspondence. Uh, I, of course, would try to pump in for information. He would be curious as to why I was curious about these things. I perhaps didn't realize at the time that he was pumping me for information. <laughs> and that, that led to, to contacts um, with other people who were interested in Riley. Uh, one of them was a, was a fellow who was a journalist um, and, and an historical writer by the name of Michael Kettle. And Kettle, in fact, in the early 80s, in fact, right after the Riley Ace of Spies series came out, Michael Kettle, I think around 82 or 83, published uh, a very short volume, I think it's called Sidney Riley, the, the, the True Story. Uh, and I've figured out since then, you always have to look out for any kind of, of anything titled The True Story, because <laughs> yes. I'll bet you it almost yeah. always isn't. Um, but Kettle was an interesting – he and I also began a correspondence, and I have to say that was interesting because Michael Kettle and Robin Lockhart, both of them sorely departed now, I would have to say did not get along. And they had very different views about Riley and many other things. And so I kind of found myself, well, betwixt and between the two. Yeah. Uh, I could get along with both, but they would uh, – had very un unpleasant things to say about each other, which 
with you. I, I think we're more personal yeah. than yeah. anything else. But that it, it what I began to find was that there were a whole variety of of different views and. You know, Robin Lockhart would basically admit that, well, you know, this is what I wrote based on the information that I had back in the 60s. But, you know, keep in mind, we're communicating in the, the 1980s by this time. But he goes, my, my, my views on that have really kind of changed uh, a lot. Uh, you know, I've realized that there was information that I was given that wasn't reliable. And um, so I, my, my views on that have, have evolved. And, and sure enough, I think it was around 19. 19- 87, in other words, about 20 years after he wrote the initial Riley Ace of Spies book, Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. although it's difficult to find today, Robin Lockhart wrote another book. He wrote a kind of sequel called Riley the First Man. And the whole gist of that book, um, which really doesn't have a whole lot to it, but the important thing to it is that his argument was that, well, you know, my whole portrayal of Riley is a a dedicated uh, fire-breathing anti-Bolshevik and a a martyr to the early East-West political struggle was fundamentally false because his argument was that in 1925, Raleigh defected. And then, in fact, he had been working for the Soviets sometime prior to that. Hence, the, the idea that he is the first man as a, as a kind of nod towards the, the Cambridge spy ring. Right. Was, gotcha. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, which would come up. And that was kind of interesting. And so Robin Lockhart himself kind of did a 180 in in terms of his. Now, the interesting thing was his argument in the book very clearly is that Riley was not a Soviet mole prior to 1918, that that only happened later. And there, there's a reason for that. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is that, of course, in 1918, Riley in Russia, you know, the, the whole sort of uh, supposed uh, the thing is called the Lockhart plot. Yes. He was involved with Robin Lockhart's father. Yes. Um, in, uh, you know, Robert Bruce Lockhart in terms of uh, in this supposed plot to topple Lenin. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and end the Soviet regime. So you see, if you if you took Riley back as effectively a well, I don't know, let's call him a traitor uh, in, in 1918, that he wasn't what he seemed, then that would mean that Lockhart's father was either a dupe or an accomplice, which was not something um, that he was really interested in going into. Yeah. And in fact, one yeah. of the things that I think it's fair to say that Robin Lockhart was really dedicated to do more than anything else, and I don't fault him for it, was protecting his father's reputation. Yes. yes. And Riley was a kind of complication in that reputation. You know, depending upon who Riley was and what he was doing, that then tended to reflect upon dad in this case. And I think that's why in the initial book, you know, in the original Riley Ace of Spies, portraying Riley as a a, a loyal British agent and anti-Bolshevik crusader fit perfectly with the view that he wanted to put forward, you know, which reflected well upon his father. And in the later version, he simply decided, and this by Amy and Robin Lockhart, that that version was untenable, but he argued that Riley only sort of turned against British interests after 1918 in the early 1920s. Now, I have to say, uh, as time has gone on, that I, I think Robin Lockhart's later estimation was basically the correct one. Aha, uh-huh, right. Uh-huh. Although I think that he was mistaken on one thing, uh, and that that Riley's connection to Soviet interests not only goes back to 1918, but goes back even earlier. And and this is one of the things that I've found. You know, I, I could say in some ways Riley is one of those characters that, on one hand, I kind of wish I'd never run into, <laughs> uh, and yet on the other hand, I'm very glad that I did because it was an entree into a whole, a whole kind of historical basement <laughs> or a series of interlocking basements. This, this whole kind of historical underworld that I, I'm, you know, that. I'm not sure I would necessarily have been able to discover or discover in the same way without him. And yet the other thing about him is that the, the fellow is a, is a is a constant enigma. 
uh, in terms of trying to figure out, you know, when, when you work, when, you, when you're trying to piece together a person's life, and I, I, you know, for some reason I've fallen into writing more biographical works than anything else. You have to, you know, you have to develop some sense as to who this person is. Yep. You have to, at some point, imagine that you have a kind of insight in, into their thinking, that, that you have a kind of connection with who that person is. So, for instance, going back to the first biography I wrote, the one on Boris Savinkov, the Russian revolutionary and then counter-revolutionary who was an associate of Riley. In, in, in Savinkov's case, I, you know, I fancied that I eventually did have some kind of insight into his mentality. Uh, I, I could see the world, you know, or at least I could believe that I could see the world in the way that, that Savinkov would see it. With Riley, that kind of certainty never has appeared because he's, he's a kind of chameleon. And uh, it's, it's very clear that he played a, a variety of roles uh, in the same way that he assumed a variety of identities. I mean, let, let's let's go back to the, the basic fact here. Sidney Riley wasn't really Sidney Riley. Mm -hmm. right. Sidney Riley is an artificial identity, more or less just, you know, created off the shelf through a passport he was given in 1899. And that's how Sidney Riley was created. But that's not the name he was born under. That's not even who he was all the time. <laughs> um, it's one of the things I would find later in sort of, you know, in, in putting together a bigger picture of Riley's life, that there are periods. Sometimes there are a few months, sometimes there are several months, but usually you can kind of document where he was or where he's going, his travel, but then he'll just disappear for a while. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that sort of raised the question in my mind is that was there always some kind of, was there an alternate identity which is going on? That is, in certain periods, did he simply stop being Sidney Riley and then become or resume being someone else? And, you know, that's a question that I still, well, I mean, he, he certainly did that. On a variety. There were a number of, any number of names that, that he used. He was quite capable of coming up with separate identities if he wanted to. But I, I don't think, I'm not convinced that I know all of them. Right. Uh, I still have this uh, haunting suspicion that there's another identity for this fellow, maybe his real one, which remains elusive, that was always running at the same time that he was he was operating as Riley. So that comes down to this real question is who was Riley really? And he's not Riley. That's an assumed identity. Yeah. yeah. His original name, if you go back again to Robin Lockhart's work and you look at others, is that, well, he, he began life uh, essentially as a – born into a Russian or Polish-Jewish family of the Rosenblum, um, that he was uh, Sigmund Rosenblum. And in fact, when he first appears in the UK in 1894, he was there at least that early, that's the name that he's using. He's operating as Sigmund Solomon Rosenblum. And you can find that there, there really was a, a, a Sigmund Solomon Rosenblum, and he had a whole family, and he had sisters and parents and grandparents. And it's not a question as to whether or not Solomon or Sigmund Rosenblum existed, but whether that was Riley's original identity or whether, as I now suspect, it was simply the first identity that he stole. Uh -huh. You know, see, today we talk about we you know, identity theft is fairly yeah. common, but it's always been around to one degree or another. And in fact, in the past, if you go back to the pre-digital age, you know, you go back to the late 18th century, it was relatively easy to pass yourself off as, an, as another person. So it's one of these things that there's you can find a, a documented history of Sigmund Rosenblum where he was born, who his family were, um, up to about adolescence or late adolescence, up to about university age. Mm -hmm. But then one of two things happened. Either he in some way eventually transforms himself into Riley in 1890, or he disappears in some other way. Mm 
because in Riley's background, as much as I can put together, the two don't mesh. I suppose what I'm trying to say is that if you assume that these are the same person, the locations of birth, for instance, don't really mesh. Everything, every other bit of detail that you can come up with, every other suggestion, hint, uh, all suggest that Riley's origins are in or near Odessa. Now, Odessa is today in Ukraine, then it was you know, back in the 18th and 19th century, it was part of the of the Russian Empire, um, whereas Sigmund Rosenboom's origins are in were in Poland near Warsaw. Now, there, there are two very different parts of the country. Yes. Yes. And those are there are simply factors about those I can't quite reconcile. So my. My suspicion uh, I can't prove it, but I would say that my very strong suspicion is that Riley, who wasn't, of course, really Riley, wasn't also originally really Rosenblum, that that was an identity which he assumed when he went abroad or at some point when he went abroad. And it's not clear when that happened. Yeah. So one of the places that, that he ought to show up here, here, this gives you an idea of the kind of conundrum you come across. Presumably, when Rosenblum went abroad, and one of the things that we know that he was connected with by the time he reached Britain in the mid to late 1890s, is that in addition to being a chemist, a point I'll come back to in a minute, uh, and a fairly successful one, he was also involved with the Russian emigre revolutionary underground. That is, in London, he was connected to people who were part of the anti-Tsarist political immigration. Mm -hmm. So he was he was a political immigrant to some degree, or at least he had presumably revolutionary sympathies or anti-Tsarist sympathies, those being you know, pretty much the same thing. Now, what you would assume is that the Imperial Russian secret police, then known as the Okhrana, who were very good at their job, very good at their job, their whole reason to exist was to keep track of political opposition, both within Russia and abroad. And therefore, one of the things that the Okhrana had in this period was a thing called the foreign agency, the Agentura, which was based in Paris but had sub-branches in London, Berlin, Madrid, I mean, even in places like Topeka, Kansas. Okay. <laughs> they had agents and informants all over the world. They had informers embedded within all the emigre groups, and they kept tabs on them, and they had a gigantic card file of all of the names and suspects that came up. I mean, they, they, the, the Okranos were very good at their job, and they had an excellent sources of information. So you would assume, you'd have to assume that if Sigmund Rosenblum was in any way involved in revolutionary activity abroad, he would show up mm. in that card catalog, mm. and he doesn't. There are a few Rosenblums in it, but none of them. There's, there's no trace of him anywhere in those records. And... You know, I mean, there are a couple of possible. One is that somehow the Okrana dropped the ball and they just completely missed this guy who then is active for years. Not even under the name Riley does he show up. There's nothing in there. And what that again suggests to me is that there's another name, that he's in there somewhere, but he's under the name that the Okrana actually knew him by, which is not Rosenblum. And there's there's one there's one name that actually does crop up in the in the Paris Okrana files, which is similar, not exact, is a fellow by the name of Leon Rosenblatt, who, interestingly enough, is from Odessa mm -hmm. and who also attended a medical school. Frustratingly, it doesn't say which one and studied chemistry in that mm -hmm. medical school. So the thing is, is that if you look at certain details of this Leon Rosenblatt, that seems to match the fellow who would later become Sidney Riley. And, and he too, at some point, Rosenblatt just vanishes. Um, he he's, ceases to exist. So go back to this question about Riley as a chemist. And, well, 
Let me start with something else. Let me explain the kind of problems, if I can, in, in dealing with someone like this. Yeah. You try to put together the pieces of a person's lives and you find um, various things that don't mesh. You, know, you, you, can become, you begin to realize that you're not looking at the details of one person's life. You're looking at the details of two or more people's lives who somehow been been cobbled together. And your idea is to try to find out, to find the, the, the path, the, the, find the tracks, literally, of the, of the person that you're after. As I always like to point out to my students in classes, a history is you know, about 10% fact and 90% opinion. That is, when it gets down to facts, when it gets down to those actual details, you can be you know, completely certain, which, is, which you know, are a kind of documented certainty in some way, which aren't just someone's opinion or what someone remembered in some way. Those, those are relatively few. You're listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian. And so then what, what happens is that a, a narrative is built around those facts. So, for instance, that's what in his original book, Riley, Ace of Spies, Robin Lockhart did with the limited facts he had on hand. He built a narrative or he, or he accepted the narrative that someone else had given him because you know, there wasn't any other one which was available at yeah. that time. Yeah. But what you can do is that very often, if you sort of just take the bare facts, you'll find that you can, with very little tinkering, come up with different narratives. That is, you can create a, you can create a story, you can create a kind of script around these things that can come to very different conclusions, just determining what kind of importance you want to give this or that piece of information. And that, I would warn, is often how uncertain the fabric of history is. That it's often a matter of interpretation or weighting evidence or, of, in other cases, of just preferring things to come out one way as opposed to another one. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I think that in studying Riley's career, one of the things that it certainly reinforced or maybe taught me is that you have to be able to clearly see the difference between the narrative, the opinion, and what actual reliable facts that you have. And so here's something that you can do. You can, at your peril sometimes, just reduce the story back to the basic framework of facts. Forget about the rest of the narrative, all right? Turn off all those other voices that are telling you this is what this means and this is important and this are how things are going. And then look and see what actually emerges if you don't impose this narrative on the facts. What 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 would they, those those simple facts lead you to? I mean, what what where will they leave you uncertain, but also what would seem to be the logical conclusion if you weren't being told something otherwise? That is, if you weren't being constantly told that Riley was an anti-Bolshevik crusader, what might it suggest when you realize that he was never involved in any anti-Bolshevik operation that succeeded? That everything which was anti-Soviet or anti-Bolshevik that he was involved in failed. Mm. Well, at the very least, it meant that he wasn't very successful in what he was doing. Or the other possibility was that in some way was his presence in these things responsible, or at least partly responsible for, for their failure. So this, this brings us back to the, that Lockhart plot of 1918, you know, the, the kind of centerpiece of so much about Riley. And, 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 you know, this, this is where he was putting together a plan. He was going to subvert uh, the Latvian troops guarding the Kremlin, arrest Lenin and Trotsky, uh, topple the Soviet regime and you know, re- restore something in Russia. And in history, as we know, it would be changed. And, and Riley was the fellow who was in control of this. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, that failed. Uh, it it failed horribly. It basically managed to the the plot rather than toppling Lenin and Trotsky, 
ended up effectively destroying most of the Allied intelligence gathering apparatus in Russia. And it did so by incriminating everybody. Okay, What you got was a kind of half-baked plot into which the British, uh, into which the Americans, and in which the French were all drawn, and what it ended up doing was compromising every single one of their agents. Yeah. Therefore, what it produced was seemingly exactly the opposite of what it was intended, unless, from the standpoint of Raleigh, that's what was intended. See, this is where you can create these uh, very different explanations for what happened. So was it just bad luck that the plot failed, or was it all really just a provocation designed to draw people in, compromise them, and then expose them? Now, the, the thing about Riley going back to the beginning part of his career, which in some ways I, I find still the most interesting because it's when the, he sort of appears, it's sort of the birth of this person. He was, as I mentioned before, a, a fairly accomplished chemist. So the first real place I can find him that he shows up is in September 1894. Mm. He is living near Bristol, not in London. He's living near Bristol, and he is employed. He is a chemist employed by the Polysulfan Soap Company. And Polysulfan Soap Company, and he comes into the public record because in September 1894, Sigismund Georgievich Rosenblum is assigned a patent for the purification of animal fats to be used in soap manufacturing. OK, that's, you know, that's not particularly sexy, but that's that's where he first shows up, okay. which also tells you that he'd probably been there for a while. In other words, he wasn't going to be if he had been there working for at least some period of months. So you yeah. could put yeah. his. So he's probably been there since earlier in, in 1894. And that's interesting because that's about two years earlier than what I had been able to find before, which was his membership uh, when he then became a, a fellow of the Chemical Society in London in 1896. And then in the following year, he becomes a fellow of the Institute of Chemistry in London. So if you put together those facts, what, what can they kind of reasonably tell you? Well, you've got a fellow who um, certainly has enough knowledge of chemistry to – get a job doing that, he's able to secure a patent. And this is only one of about four patents under the Rosenblum name that he will have. So he knows chemistry. He's not yeah. faking that. Yeah. And if he knows chemistry, see, he had to have some kind of education somewhere. Uh, but that's one of those things that still uh, is still a mystery as to exactly where he obtained his education or under what name. But now you can see why that Leon Rosenblatt name who was studying chemistry at an unnamed medical school somewhere on the continent becomes so interesting. So the future Sidney Riley did have a legitimate background in chemistry, and he was fairly successful at that. Yes. Uh, by 1897, 1898, he's now changed his employment is with a thing called the Commercial Ozone Syndicate. And um, that, again, was largely involved in creating compounds that were involved in things like water purification, um, one of the things that ozone was used for early on. And, and then you find him as an employee for this commercial ozone syndicate, which is uh, headed by a retired Indian Army officer, a fellow by the name of uh, uh, W.J. Engledew. And uh, but also people who are involved with this are a fairly noted chemist by the name of Samuel Redeal uh, that, that, that Rosenblum would actually co-patent a, a process with. And the other, the most interesting person involved with that company was Professor Julius Levkovich. So why was Julius Levkovich interesting? Well, Julius Levkovich was considered at the time to be one of Europe's or the world's experts on plant and animal fats and their use in manufacturing. He had been educated in Germany and had taught those very subjects at Heidelberg University. Now, 
uh, I'd say, well, Levkovich, you know, was uh, that, that Rosenblum was his student. Well, it's not quite that simple because Levkovich had left Heidelberg in 1888, long before Rosenblum would have been in university or anything else. But I suspect that there's a connection between the two of them. That there is that Levkovich is probably in some way responsible or instrumental in bringing Rosenblum into this company. So, but this is the kind of early portrait you get. You get someone who's essentially a, a chemist, um, a scientist in some way, and and who has a you know, actually manages to patent procedures. And you could imagine in some parallel universe where he simply goes on to have a fairly successful career in that. So what leads this chemist, a, a person whose expertise is in the purification of animal and plant fats for the use in soap, what leads a, a soap maker to become this future ace of spies? Well, the thing you find is that Rosenblum apparently has a double life. And that double life involves, again, his political activity. And that political activity is uh, radical, even revolutionary, uh, anti-Czarist. And he is involved. There is a, a very important figure sort of in the Russian revolutionary movement. They're kind of, you know, sometimes called the Sherlock Holmes of the Russian Revolution. Uh, as a fellow by the name of Vladimir Burtsev. And Vladimir Burtsev is a person who... I've been acquainted with in many ways, and uh, you know, Vladimir Burtsev was was nobody's fool. Uh, not that he couldn't be fooled, but he was a very astute observer of people, and he was quite careful with his statements. So, I Burtsev is fairly reliable, or at least more reliable than most in his opinions. And Burtsev later would clearly remember that around 1897, he met Rosenblum in London. And that Rosenblum was then an assistant to a fellow, another emigre from the Russian Empire by the name of Wilfred Voynich. And Wilfred Voynich was, well, he would make his career as a, as a, a rare book collector, or more in you know, some cases, the, the discoverer and purveyor of rare books. Yes. And today, if somebody thinks the name Voynich sounds vaguely familiar, uh, Wilfred Voynich is today probably most closely connected to a thing called the Voynich Manuscript, which is this very mysterious 14th, 15th century, nobody's exactly sure, manuscript of illustrated pictures and people and written, in, written in apparently a language that no one has ever been able to decipher. And so anybody who's interested in that can simply look up the Voynich manuscript. So but this is the thing that Voynich claims to have found. And I'd have to say, as an aside, my whole theory about the Voynich manuscript is that it's really a very well done experiment in forgery. And that's the reason <laughs> it's right. it's right. simply to sort of put up to see what you know, what you could put across. Um. And then you find out that it's around the same period that what what role did um, did Rosenblum, the chemist, what what was his role in this? Well, remember he is a chemist with an expertise in plant and animal fats, which are very important in producing what pigments, mm. inks, colorings. You know, one of the things that if you're going to reproduce or you're going to forge some older manuscript, you got to make sure that the ink and the paper match. Yeah. And Voynich yeah. paid careful attention to those things. So you find out in the same period that Rosenblum gets a reader's card for the British Library. And what subjects was he interested in? Well, ancient pigments and medieval pigments and tapestries. So what that revolves around to is that the thing that Rosenblum and Voynich were involved in was in counterfeiting Russian rubles. Okay, that's that's one of the things that the Okarana eventually actually caught on to, that there was a counterfeiting ring of Russian imperial currency in London. And that basically was exposed, came under too much attention around 1899, 
And that's when Riley gets a new passport, and or rather gets Riley, Rosenblum gets a passport in the name of Sidney George Riley and disappears to the Far East, gets out of town as fast as he can, because he apparently got caught in something. Right, because it was my understanding that someone involved with the British secret services Yes. Assisted him getting the passport and may even have, he got it when he got married, I think, didn't he? And well, he got married. He married a woman by the name of uh, Margaret Thomas in in August 19 in August 1888. And he gets the passport the following June in June 1899. Yes, the, the person who got him the passport, it, it's pretty clear. In fact, I think at some point he admits it is uh, William Melville. And William Melville was uh, you know, basically head of Scotland Yard, had earlier been head of you know, the Irish branch, Melville himself being interestingly Irish. So, you know, Melville was a fellow who sort of cut his teeth in Scotland Yard, battling the Fenian menace, and then went on to battle the anarchist menace, and uh, was really sort of at the height of his influence in 1898, 1899. And what he did is that he employed Rosenblum as an informant. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this gets into, we were talking before about the, the kind of subterranean world of connections and interconnections. Yeah. yeah. Here's the kind of lay of the land in that period. In the 1890s, the British empire and Russian empires were on a global scale rivals, very serious mm -hmm. rivals. But on the other hand, there are also occasions when their officials or representatives of those two groups could cooperate. And one of the things that both empires faced was what was assumed to be the, the threat of political radicalism. So remember that Melville in London was obsessed with the anarchist threat. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The czarist regime was, of course – obsessed with a, a revolutionary threat, which a good part of which was influenced by anarchism. So there was a way to cooperate there. And what happened, and you and you can find this in the Okrana records themselves, is that they would share assets with each other. That is, you would have the same person who would be working both as an informant for Scotland Yard and as an informant for the Okrana because they're both essentially informing on the same people. Right. All right. And that's what Rosenblum was doing. So he was working with Voynich, but he also was uh, ratting out his activities to both the Russians and to Melville. So there, were, there was a certain convergence of interests. Yeah. It's, it's one of these, these terms I've become particularly fond of because it, it does a lot to explain relationships that you, you don't explain through things like friendship. Okay, Very often what happens on this kind of level is that there is a convergence of interests. Simplest way of thinking about it, you and I both have the same enemy. Now, we don't necessarily trust or like each other. Mm -hmm. But, in fact, we may thoroughly mistrust and dislike each other. But for the time being, we have a common problem that a certain limited degree of cooperation between the two of us can be mutually advantageous. We can go back to cutting each other's throats tomorrow, but today we're going to cooperate. And that was the kind of relationship that Melville had with his counterparts in the Okrana in Paris and their properties in London. He knew who their people were, and he let them operate and share assets back and forth. So one of the things you can detect in this, if you could sort of put the pieces together or follow the dots, is you've got Rosenblum, the chemist, who has a double life as an informant for both Scotland Yard and the Okrana, that he's there's a certain element of advantageous treachery in his nature. <laughs> yes. So that should tell you about something in terms of trying to figure out what his true allegiance were. And, and this is why later comments by people who encountered him, say, during the First World War, um, was that, you know, th this is a fellow who's, who's, who's very bright and he has lots of information, but he's completely unreliable. Okay because he will take any situation and he will exploit it to his advantage or to some other advantage. In other words, he's untrustworthy. Mm 
He's knowledgeable but untrustworthy, and you can use him, but you have to use him very carefully because he's trying to use you at the same time, and you have to be constantly aware of that. Uh, William Melville himself is a – well, that's, that's a whole topic on its own in some ways, but uh, Melville is, is probably the guy who – has more to do with the founding of modern British intelligence than just about anyone else because he would retire. Uh, he was a very accomplished schemer. Um, that's one of the things that he had learned uh, in, in his uh, years in, in Scotland Yard. And then in 1903, he retires rather abruptly and then turns around, I think the same day, and opens a private detective agency except it's not really a private detective agency. It's still working for the British government, but now it's doing so as a kind of contractor. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of the things that uh, sort of harkens to things today. Uh, you know, governments, modern governments, the British, American, everybody else has both their regular intelligence agencies, but then they also have intelligence contractors. People, what are essentially private firms who are contracted to do anything from signals intelligence or other things that nobody wants to talk about. Yeah. And one of the reasons why that can be handy is because when things are done by private contractors, they don't generate government documents. Mm -hmm. They don't generate mm -hmm. things that could be possibly exposed later on through pesky Freedom of Information Acts. And also, to a certain degree, they're deniable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the so you can you know back at the beginning of the 20th century, you can see it. Melville quit Scotland Yard, opened up a private detective agency. But the private detective agency is still in full communication with officials in the British government. And then in 1909, six years down the road, when there's going to be a major overhaul in British intelligence, where what will become MI5, and MI6 are first created at the creation who is there giving advice? William Melville. Mm -hmm. So in fact, today, mm -hmm. I think he's generally given credit for being the guy who created MI5 as kind of an extension in some way of his private agency, but also had a tremendous amount of influence on, on foreign intelligence as well. So I, I think his encounter with Rosenblum, the future Riley, was very important, not the least of which it was Melville who apparently – for whatever reasons, as Rosenblum became too exposed, as, as his presence in Britain became too complicated, mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. because if somebody arrested him one way, it was going to expose other people. Melville gets him a new passport, sends him off to China, all the way to the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what does he do once he gets to the Far East? He goes into business. So here you've got now the Riley, you know, he, he had been a, a chemist, a professional chemist, off in the Far East as the newly minted Sidney George Riley, he becomes a businessman. And so you find that uh, by 1900, he's in Port Arthur, a Russian controlled port in China. Mm hmm. And he's in business with a fellow by the name of Grinberg, and they have a company. They, they're taking out ads in newspapers. I mean, this is how I found out. You know, I went through the Straits Times and other English language newspapers, the North China Herald that would come up. And here you find advertisements for Grinberg and Riley, general merchants and purveyors and stevedores. Okay, they, they basically sold, they imported and sold everything they could. In, in, in China. And they had other branch offices in China. They expanded outside of their, of their base in, in Port Arthur. So an ongoing mystery here is exactly who R.A. Grinberg, Riley's partner in this company, was. Because they're doing business with each other for the, for the next few years. Um, you could look at little clues. Grinberg's name which in various sources you'll find it Greenberg, Greenberg, G-R-I-N-G-R-U-N. But if you actually look at the company's letterhead on their envelopes, Greenberg is G-R-U-N-B-E-R-G, -E but there is an umlaut, you know, those two telltale mm -hmm. tell Teutonic mm -hmm. marks over the U. So what that suggests to me is that Greenberg was 
most likely German, because Germans like their umlauts. Generally, when the name gets anglicized or Russianized, that gets dropped. That's one of the first things that disappears, generally just because people don't have typewriters yeah. that have umlauts. Yeah. There. But Grunberg's name clearly had that. So uh, he may have been a German national. I think that's probably the most likely explanation, not to say there aren't others, but, you know, how they, you know, how Riley, you know, remember in June 19, in June 1889, Sidney Riley is created. He goes off to the Far East. By April 1900, less than a year later, he's already in business in Port Arthur with Grunberg, and they're taking out ads for business. So again, how that transformation took place is itself one of, one of these sort of many mysteries that remain. <laughs> So now we got this fellow who's a businessman, uh, and, and they deal in everything. They import everything from small arms to timber, and uh, Riley also branches out. He gets, he gets a second job. He becomes a shipping agent for a thing called the East Asiatic Steamship Company. That brings him into contact with uh, one of the things he's deeply involved in is, is a lumber business, timber. Now we're almost out of time. We'll be back with the second and concluding part of our interview with Richard Spence next week. But before we go, here's a quick quote attributed to Riley. Apparently one occasion when he was in London, he was being introduced to another Russian anti-Bolshevik plotter called Boris Savinkov by Sir Mansfield Smith Cumming, the head of what is now known as MI6 or the Secret Intelligence Service. I don't believe your paths have crossed, said Sir Mansfield. No, replied Riley. But they've double-crossed. Sir Mansfield, incidentally, would in meetings stab his left leg with a knife or letter opener if he thought people's concentration was wandering. This attention-grabbing stunt only worked if you were unaware he wore an artificial leg and he was just stabbing the knife into a wooden leg. Anyway, this is Charles Christian saying thank you for listening in. Please join me again next time. Until then, stay well, stay weird. Goodbye. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories urban myths, witchcraft, folklore, and the paranormal. You can keep in touch with us online at www.urbanfantasist.com, by email to urbanfantasist at icloud.com, and on Twitter at urbanfantasist. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Goodbye. <laughs>